Tonight's top European Union stories from the Unit UK include There's a simple solution to this Euro elections sham. Europe is impotent in the face of deflation. And the EU warns over alarming youth unemployment. European Union injects billions to boost Africa's development. Plus, rail bottlenecks in Finland to be eliminated thanks to EU funding. A big thanks to all of you who have subscribed to our YouTube channel so far. Sue is busy contacting people and asking them to join us on our live show Table Talk. It may seem simple, but helping us increase the subscribers to our YouTube channel makes it much more likely that these guests will join us. So, thanks once again for helping us, and please keep encouraging others to do this. It's Tuesday, 29th of April. I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First up, the hot story from our website, theunituk.com. There's a simple solution to this Euro elections sham. It seems incredible that there is only a month to go, only a few nail-biting weeks until the climacteric in geopolitics, the chance for us all to flood to the polling stations, snatch our ballot papers and vote in the Euro elections. Across this continent of 27 nations and 510 million people, we will be deciding who should serve us in Strasbourg and Brussels. It's one of the biggest global exercises of democracy, and it's a complete sham. Let me ask you a question. Now, no peeking at the internet, no conferring. Can you tell me the name of your Euro MP? Okay, I thought not. Can you tell me what he or she does? Hmm, you see what I mean? This Euro Parliament is a failed experiment. Every election, it arouses less and less interest in the people of Europe. Every time we stage this farce, the turnout goes down. With every year its existence, the Euro Parliament deepens the general suspicion of the public that the EU is a racket and that the MEPs are on a gigantic boondoggle. The Euro Parliament costs hundreds of millions just to transport the MEP caravan from Brussels to Strasbourg and back. Never mind the colossal cost for their allowances for secretaries and limousines. It's a gigantic waste of money. And yet the real tragedy is that with every year the Parliament loses public support and public interest. It gains in practical power. Now in this article, Boris Johnson digs deeper into the European project. And to follow this, on Thursday this week, we'll be holding a live table talk show discussing the European elections. And in the show, we'll be looking at the structure of the EU institutions. We'll be discussing who and what the electorate are voting for. And we'll have more details on this later in the show. Europe is impotent in the face of deflation. According to Jürgen Stark, a former board member of the European Central Bank, it is not just misguided but irresponsible to be warning about the threat of deflation in Europe. Instead, he invites us to shut up about it altogether. For the longer this discussion continues and the more intense it becomes, the more likely the risk of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let's just close down the debate he seems to be saying, because we policymakers know better. The evidence of the past three years, it has to be said, strongly suggests otherwise. In any case, the prophecy of price deflation seems to be coming true all by itself, without any assistance from the likes of yours truly. Eurozone inflation dropped to 0.5% in March, and Greece saw price disinflation of 1.5%, Portugal of 0.4%, and Spain 0.2% while Italy, the Netherlands and Denmark are as close to falling prices as makes no difference. Now, many people would reasonably think of price deflation as a boon, and indeed it is when it's the result of a positive supply-side shock, such as falling energy prices. But when it's essentially the result of economic stagnation, which is the larger part of the story in, the, in Europe right now, then it becomes highly problematic, adding to debt burdens and further detracting from already depressed internal demand. Folks, we are in trouble, and here's why. 
The Eurozone High Command insists there is no deflationary threat. Rather, what is occurring is a relative price adjustment, with some countries forced to reduce their prices and wages to become competitive with others. The problem with this analysis is that if relative price adjustment is the intention, then you would still want to manage your affairs so as to meet an overall 2% inflation target. But the same effect can just as easily be achieved simply by having a higher inflation rate in the Eurozone's more competitive core. Now, the rest of this article goes on to give more depth and detail as to what is going on. And just as I have been saying on this show for over a year, this is a systemic Western problem that reaches the Bank of England, European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve. And what's likely to happen next is as follows. When money and credit growth plummets, as it has in the Eurozone, it's nevertheless incumbent on the central bank to try to deal with it. Behind the scenes, the ECB is already tooling up for the moment Germany gives in. First stop will be a negative deposit rate, though this will have little impact. Next will be some form of asset purchase programme, or credit easing, whereby the ECB prints money to buy up bank loans. And once we reach this point, then just precisely as Dr. Eric Edmund explained to us in our interview with him, we are in a hyperinflationary zone, seen before in the Weimar Republic in Germany. EU warns over alarming youth unemployment. The unemployment rate among young people in Europe is at an alarming level, said President of the European Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, on Tuesday. At the high-level conference, Youth Guarantee Making It Happen, on youth employment in Brussels, Barroso remarked that young people remain at the core of Europe's priorities as the bloc still struggles to recover from the impact of the global economic crisis. The head of the Commission described young people as the key to Europe's future dynamism and prosperity. Their talents, skills and creativity are essential to ensure European growth and competitiveness. Barroso warned that youth unemployment has reached alarming levels, representing a waste of human resources and talent that Europe simply cannot afford. He noted that it is a challenge for Europe that growth is resuming, slowly but surely, but it urgently needs to translate this into job opportunities. Well, we're not sure which book of economic theory Manuel Barroso is reading. We're inclined to think it's Noddy's Big Blue Book of Money. As the previous story and the details of this article reveal, there is nothing being done to improve things. EU injects billions to boost Africa's development. Meanwhile, while the EU nations are wheeling their way to hell in a handbasket with a squeaky wheel, the EU kleptocrats continue to pour vast amounts of money into Africa. Firstly, it's important to realise that the whole of Europe would fit more than five times into the continent of Africa. This is a big hole, and filling it with money is an expensive task. The European Union says it is set to strengthen trade, economic and political relations with Africa within the next three years. This as the continent continues to attract new investors and economic growth in some African countries is up to a record double-digit growth rates. This was revealed by the head of European Union delegation, Ambassador Roald van de Geer, who was speaking at the SAR EU Africa Review special address in Pretoria this week. He says the EU-Africa summit held in Brussels was a success. We expect to make available over the next coming three years 28 billion euros in development assistance and we hope to push our mutual trade over the coming years considerably but we have not put any figures to that or the trade because it cannot be controlled by governments or presidents. It's just something that should just happen. And on that note, Mario Draghi fell to his knees before his armada of Heidelberg money printers and wept. For he knew he and the European Central Bank could not print enough money to fulfil the spending commitments of his Bruswellian emperors. Rail bottlenecks in Finland to be eliminated thanks to EU funding. The European Union will support with 12.8 million euros from the TEN-T programme, a project addressing one of the worst bottlenecks on the Finnish rail network. 
The project, selected under the 2012 10T annual program, will improve the railway line between the Finnish cities of Levieska and Ula, and includes construction of a new double-track line between Rua and Lapua. It is part of the broader Senujok Ulu project that aims to improve the main railway connection between the southern and northern parts of the country. It's wet that this article has turned up on my desk today, just as the UK Parliament HS2 objectors get their objections kicked out of the door of Westminster. Of course, Big Cheese Dave Cameroni will, as usual, propose that HS2 is a UK government initiative, and this is good economic and political thinking from the Conservatives. <laughs> well, it isn't. HS2 is just as with this rail network project in Finland, part of a larger European Union 10T project. The Tenti proposals are not just a set of nice ideas for routes across Europe with a handy pot of money attached. Once this was what they were, but no longer. Now Tenti policy is both more politicised and it is no longer so voluntary. Sadly, the money being spent on this one line would be more than enough to reinstate many of the interconnecting branch lines across the UK, which could then be utilised to reduce road transport congestion and organise a lower cost and more efficient logistics network in Britain. So, why wouldn't the government do that? Two reasons. One, EU state aid rules prohibit the British government from undertaking such a project. Two, Foreign and Commonwealth Office Document 301048, which I quote, says, After entry there would be a major responsibility on Her Majesty's Government and on all political parties not to exacerbate public concern by attributing unpopular measures or unfavourable economic developments to the remote and unmanageable workings of the European community. And that, folks, is how we are being betrayed. Now, for new viewers, you can find out more detail about how we have been duped into handing over control and governance of Britain to the remote parliamentary buildings of Brussels and Strasbourg. Watch our film, Betrayed. It's in the film section of our video library, and the links are below. Well, heads up folks, we have another live interactive table talk show that you can get involved with later this week. We're going to be taking a look at the European elections which are to be held on May 22nd. Now, this includes looking at candidates' profiles for the new president of the European Commission. Oh, those are the ones that you can't vote on, by the way. And we'll be looking at the structure of the European parliamentary system and hoping to unravel how it works. I mean, it's always helpful to actually know what it is you're voting for. And how do the mainstream National Party campaigns relate to Europe? Now, we really want to hear from you. We want to include and try to answer your questions. And so please do email those into us via the contacts page on our website. Now, we're also looking for guests to join us on the show. You'll need a Google Plus account, webcam and microphone. The show preparations start at 11.30 a.m. UK summertime and the show goes live to the front page of our website and our YouTube channel from 12 noon and runs until 1 o'clock. We're all done and dusted by 1.15, so what are you waiting for? Take a look at the help page in our resources section for details of how you can join the panel. Now, there will be a phone and SMS text in service available, and Sue will be on hand when the lines open to take your calls, and better still, you can text your comments and questions to the same number. Of course, you can comment via Twitter by mentioning at the E unit in your post. This is the only the second live show we've done, so we fully expect there to be still a few teething issues, and we hope you'll stick with us as we iron these out. We are bringing you these shows via state-of-the-art medium, and you know what they say about technology. Now, this week in our video library we have several short films, all relating to the European elections. These include National Party Campaign, Party Political Broadcasts, and the Presidential Campaign Broadcasts by the Candidates for the European Commission. Today we have the full-length and first-ever live EU presidential debate. This will give you a huge amount of background into what is happening in these EU elections, what the issues are, and provide you with lots of information and hopefully generate lots of questions that we can talk about in our table talk on Thursday. So, remember, book it in your diary this Thursday, 1st of May, live at noon. Join us here at theunituk.com. Now, 
Do remember to visit our website, theunituk.com, for all the very latest news. You can find our page on Facebook by searching for The Unit UK, all one word. Join our community on Google+, Plus, where you can interact with us, voice your opinions, and post comments about our stories, and even get involved in the shows. And for all the latest tweets as they happen, then follow us on Twitter, at The E Unit. And, of course, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for The Unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>